What is up everyone? In today's video, we're going to discuss the topic of electronegativity. To better understand the content of this video, it's important to know a few basics about the quantum mechanical model of the atom and chemical bonding. So if you need to, scroll on down to the description of this video where I've provided links to my videos on these topics, and that'll get you where you need to be. So without further ado, let's define the term electronegativity. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself in a chemical bond. To introduce this concept, consider the Lewis dot structure for hydrogen chloride. This Lewis structure tells us that the chlorine atom has three electron pairs all to itself, the lone pairs as it were, and that the fourth pair of electrons is shared between the hydrogen and the chlorine in the form of a single covalent bond. What this structure doesn't tell you is the degree to which the electrons are shared between the two atoms. Are they shared equally or unequally between the two atoms? Well, this structure tends to imply that the electrons are shared equally. I mean, after all, the dots are the same size and the pair of dots is equidistant from the two chemical symbols. What do you think? Well, it turns out that the electrons in that single covalent bond are actually shared unequally between the two atoms because one of the atoms is more electronegative than the other. That is, one of those atoms has a higher ability to attract electrons toward itself than the other. In this case, the chlorine atom is more electronegative than the hydrogen atom, so the chlorine tends to pull most of that electron density in that single covalent bond toward itself, away from the hydrogen, and the hydrogen's like, Dude, don't be so electronegative, bro. As a result of the unequal electron distribution between the two atoms, the more electronegative atom acquires a partial negative charge, not a full negative charge, which would be the case if the chlorine had gained an entire electron, but a partial negative charge because the chlorine has gained some electron density, but less than an entire electron. This leaves the less electronegative atom, in this case the hydrogen, with a partial positive charge. Notice that the symbol used to show partial positive and negative charges is a Greek lowercase delta. Another way to show partial positive and negative charges is by using this type of arrow, which is pointed in the direction of the more electronegative atom. Notice that the tail of the arrow looks like a plus sign, so that's a pretty easy way to remember which direction the arrow should be pointed. This type of bond, one in which the atoms have acquired partial charges as a result of a difference in electronegativity, is called a polar covalent bond. The bond is said to be polarized toward the more electronegative atom. So what makes some elements more electronegative than others? Well, the attractive force that pulls electron density towards an atom of high electronegativity comes from the positive charge of its nucleus. Of course, elements differ in the number of protons in their nuclei, but they also differ in the size of their electron clouds, or the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. In addition, elements also differ in the degree to which valence electrons, the outermost electrons, are shielded from the positive charge of that nucleus by core electrons. Consider the halogens fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine and their positions in the periodic table. The valence electrons in atoms of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are located in orbitals that are in the n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and n equals 5 principal energy levels, respectively, where n is the principal quantum number. As the principal quantum number increases from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5, the orbitals get successively larger and further away from the nucleus. Since the higher principal energy level valence electrons are located further away from the lower principal energy level valence electrons, there isn't as much of an attractive force between the nucleus and the valence electrons because they're located so much further away. As a result, electronegativity tends to decrease as you move down a group of the periodic table. And again, that's because as you move down a group of the periodic table, the atoms are getting much bigger and the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons becomes larger, causing a weaker attractive force between them. What do you think happens to electronegativity as you move from left to right across a period? Well, consider carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, all of which belong to the second period of the periodic table. Going one step to the right across the period adds one proton to the nucleus, making it more positively charged. Now, the valence electrons don't feel the full attractive force coming from that nucleus because in all three of these elements, there are also two core electrons that are shielding the valence electrons from the full effect of that positive charge. The effective nuclear charge is a term that describes the positive charge that the valence electrons feel, and it can be approximated by using the formula Z sub EFF equals Z minus S, where Z is simply the atomic number, and S is the number of shielding electrons, which are basically just the core electrons, the inner shell electrons, the non-valence electrons, if you will. In the case of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the effective nuclear charge increases 
increase is going from left to right. Notice that in all three cases, there are only two shielding electrons, which are the electrons located in the previous principal energy level, the N equals one principal energy level. Even though oxygen has more valence electrons than nitrogen, which has more valence electrons than carbon, those additional valence electrons in oxygen and nitrogen don't provide any shielding. Only the core electrons provide shielding to the valence electrons. As a result, oxygen is the most electronegative element out of these three, and carbon is the least electronegative element out of these three. And again, that's because in the case of oxygen, the valence electrons are being held more tightly by that nucleus as a result of its higher effective nuclear charge. So the general trend in electronegativity is that it increases moving from left to right across a period. And again, that's because as you go from left to right across a period, the effective nuclear charge increases as a result of packing on more positively charged protons with no additional shielding. So now that we know that electronegativity decreases going down a group and that it increases as you move from left to right across a period, we're in a pretty cool position where we can look at two elements in the periodic table and predict which one will be more electronegative simply based on their positions in the periodic table. Now, it won't work all the time and there are plenty of exceptions, but it's still a useful general trend. Let's do an example, shall we? Which of the two elements, gallium or phosphorus, is more electronegative? Looking at the periodic table and considering the trends that we discussed a moment ago, we can infer that phosphorus is gonna be more electronegative than everything directly below it in the periodic table. And that's because electronegativity, again, tends to decrease as you travel down a group. And then if we take a look at gallium, we can infer that gallium is gonna be less electronegative than everything directly to the right of it, because again, electronegativity tends to increase traveling from left to right across a period. So phosphorus being the highest and rightmost element of the two is more electronegative than gallium. That is all for now. There's certainly more to discuss in the context of electronegativity, but nevertheless, I do believe that this would be a good stopping point. Electronegativity is not just something that you learn once, take a test on it, and then never have to think about it again. Electronegativity is gonna pop up over and over and over again over the course of your chemistry education, so it is very important to have a rock solid understanding of it and that will serve you well. Thank you so much for watching. Please feel free to drop a like on this video if you think it's well deserved and don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you'll be notified the instant my next video is uploaded. And most importantly, please leave me a comment, leave me your feedback. Your feedback is absolutely essential to the growth and improvement of this channel and I would absolutely love to know what topics you'd like to see discussed on this channel in the future. Thanks again for watching and have a good one.